So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ and a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition. We're delighted today to also welcome Beth Moore from Friends and Tent to Nations North America. So Beth, welcome to you too. Uh, Daoud Nasser, friend, farmer, peace activist, Tent of Nations farm outside of Bethlehem. I know many of you have been there and visited Daoud on site on the 100 acres. Daoud Nasser, uh, welcome today. It's good to see you, my friend. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. I'm glad to be with you all. Thank you for this invitation. Daoud, I know you have a number of friends uh, on the call today. In, in your latest newsletter, you stated you're still waiting for the vaccine. So uh, just give us a, how, how are you and Jahan and the kids, your mom, brother and sister, how's your family doing during this COVID crisis this last year? Well, thank you so much for this question, of course. Uh, we we uh, we had and still have a, a difficult time since uh, March uh, 20, uh, when we started to have the first cases in the Bethlehem area, um, and uh, since then there were ups and downs. Um, but uh, our you know like our hospitals and clinics were also overwhelmed with the number of cases, and especially like a couple of weeks ago, we are still waiting for the vaccine. Uh, some uh, got it, and especially the ones who are working in the uh, like hospitals and like uh, uh, you know nurses and doctors. Um, but they started slowly, slowly uh, to get the, to give the vaccine for everyone. Who in your family has received the vaccine? From from our family, nobody yet. Not even your mother. Even yeah, my mother. Still not, you know, but hopefully in the next, you know, like that, we hope in the next weeks. Is, is that, uh, is that, has that been a very fairly common uh, situation throughout the Bethlehem region? I mean, it, it, the vaccine hasn't reached there yet for people of a certain age? Uh, not yet, you know, because, uh, you know, the Palestinian Authority is asking uh, for the vaccine and they are getting it from different places. We heard from Russia, from China, you know, from other places. So um, uh, people can uh, register for that, but still, you know, it's not, it's not for everyone. So people are still on the waiting list and uh, we hope that we get it uh, soon, you know, within weeks. Especially now with this, uh, as I read in your newsletter, right, the, this third wave of the virus kind of coming through the, uh, Palestinian territory. So, uh, and your situation in the Bethlehem region, that's similar in East Jerusalem or that's similar to around Ramallah or Janine or other parts of the West Bank? Well, it was worse. Uh, the uh, two, two and a half weeks ago, it was a difficult situation in Bethlehem. As I said, the, the, uh, the uh, hospitals were overwhelmed with the number of cases and uh, in some places also the lack of oxygen. Um, um, there, um, but uh, for now, for now, uh, it is becoming easier than other places in the occupied territories. Uh, other places like uh, you know uh, Nablus, Tulkarim, so the number of cases are much higher than here. Ah. Okay. Well, good. Well, I, I know that the people, uh, uh, and we're interested in uh, the overall health situation, but we, we're very much interested in the farm, Daher's Vineyard and Tent of Nations. So I want to get right into the situation about you and, and the farm, Daoud, if you don't mind. I, I guess I, I want to ask a, a number of questions, but because the farm is being besieged on a number of uh, fronts, so I'll, I'll just take them one by one. I, I guess one of the things that many of us who are your friends have been shocked by in the last number of months is the attacks on the vineyards by a few local Palestinians uh, from Nahalin. 
um, this family that's contesting the land ownership. Uh, we know that Jihan started, you know, created this women's empowerment program in the village. So it, it kind of shocked me that there were issues, you know, with people from the village. So what's going on? Uh, can you just share with us, you know, uh, from your mouth to our ears, what's going on with this particular family and what the issue is? Right. Uh, just like a bit of background information, as uh, as you all know, we have uh, we've been in a in a struggle with the Israeli authorities to keep the farm since 1991, so more than 30 years, and we can say we are in the last stages of protecting the land, of uh, of having the land being recognized as a private property. So while we are in that process, uh, uh, suddenly. Out of a sudden, uh, a family, uh, or not not a big family, like some members of a family in the village, they uh, they started to claim that this part of the land belongs to them. You know, of course, anybody can claim that uh, if he has uh, he you know if he has documents, he could should go to the court. You know, for us, it is strange because why now, after one hundred years of farming the land and, and having the land. And also where were those people when we were struggling with the Israelis for more than 30 years yeah. uh, to protect the land? Uh, anyway, uh, the, the thing is uh, still in the court, of course, like they, uh, you know, we, we, res we appealed in the court, but the legal, um, uh, the legal battle is going slowly and slowly. Our biggest challenge is not the court because we have all documents that prove our ownership to this land uh, from, you know, like uh, from more than 100 years. But the biggest struggle is, uh, uh, challenge is actually those people started to send some other people to attack the farm. So they came and cut some trees, damaged the, the, the vineyard, you know, damaged the house where the volunteers are staying. Uh, you know, they, they, they wanted to frighten us you know, uh, in, in order maybe not to go there and not to, uh, in order to give up, you know. So we are, st we are still struggling. It's a, a strange story for us right now. The timing is also uh, is has a, having a question mark, but hopefully things will, will go the right way. So just to be clear, because, so that I'm clear about this, when you say the court, are these two separate cases? In other words, you're you're doing, you got issues with the government of Israel, right? Just recognizing that this isn't common land, that it's your land. Is this a different court then? Is this a Palestinian court or is this the, I mean, talk to us about these two different court cases because it seems to me it would be a different court or a different kind of case to mm -hmm. claim this land from this Palestinian family. Right, you know, like the, um... The case with the in the Israeli military court is that because we are in what is so-called Area C after the Oslo agreements, so all the area uh, where we have the land is uh, under Israeli military control. So that's why you know, like we are appealing to the Israeli authorities, uh, you know, uh, in, in that, and and we are doing that since 1991 in the Israeli courts. Um, but uh, the the other story that happened from the family, we are dealing with that in the in the Palestinian court in Bethlehem. So although this, the land is in Area C, but the struggle on the land between two Palestinians are doing are are done or are taken in in the Palestinian court. I see. Do you know? Um, you don't. Do you have any kind of idea when this might be resolved? Well, we, we hope soon. You know, of course, like um, uh, we have some, some issues here uh, regarding the postponement. And sometimes we have the, the lawyers are on strike. Sometimes with Corona, the, the court is closed. You know, so we have all, all the things are coming together. So um, it's, uh, it's really frustrating because you know, we are dealing with issues that we are that affect affects us on daily basis, and especially the attacks. But at the same time, um, the legal the, the legal way is too slow, and this is frustrating. 
Yeah. So you've got two court cases going on simultaneously, one with the Palestinian courts about the family in Nahalin, and one in the Israeli courts that's been going on for 30 years. Have you had to uh, resurvey the land again? Uh, well, the last time we talked, it was like 14 or 15 different times you had to resurvey it. Uh, where is that process? Well, we had to do it to do it again because when we started the re-registration re process, they demanded uh, also a new land survey. So we had to do it uh, a year ago. The last one we did actually it was in 2019, two years ago. Yeah. Okay. One last question, has this uh, impacted, of course, COVID, you know, has impacted everything, but uh, has this uh, issue with this family in the village, has that impacted uh, uh, Jihan's women's empowerment program in the village at all? Um, well, you know, the COVID, right, yes, of course, because since uh, March 2020, um, we did not, I mean, uh, we had to close uh, down the, the center because of not being able, like, you know, the women could not, could not come together. It was also forbidden. Um, yeah, and then uh, uh, we, we just kept the house uh, for, for a year. Like we rented an apartment in the village to do this kind of work. And it's really sad to stop this work, this uh, project, because it's about women voices. It's about like empowering the local women and especially in the villages who do not have that much chances for education um, uh, as like in the city. And also, uh, you know, like in the village, the mentality is different than the city. So some, some uh, families do not want their daughters to be outside the village and to go for education. Anyway, it was really a very important project and work that Jihan was doing, but had to close because of the COVID. And then uh, the, uh, the people we were renting the house from, they wanted their house again. So now we are looking for a new apartment in the village and hope when things are calming down, uh, stable, uh, this project will, will come back again uh, to life, you know? Well, I know that we're all uh, happy to hear that because uh, um, uh, that's important. Um, um, I guess I was just wondering, and then we'll move on, if, if somehow the relationship that your family has with the villagers has been poisoned by th this, this family's uh, uh, issues with uh, your land. Well, you know, like uh, for us, you know, since our land is located on the hilltop and surrounded by settlements, uh, so we are protecting the whole village of Nahalin uh, from the eastern side, because the village is circulated now with, with the settlement. So we are not just protecting our private property, no, we are protecting the future of the village. And this is much respected from many people in the village. You know, they, they always tell us so. Of course, the uh, situation with the, with the family affected a bit the relationship with others, because as you know, the family, you know, like the village people are living in close society, you know, like among themselves. And of course, you know, uh, they, they don't like to, let us say, to uh, criticize one another in, in front of other people, you know, because somehow they are all related to one another. But when they see us as neighbors, for example, like yesterday, I met a neighbor and he said, he said to me, uh, and my mother was with me on the, in the car, he said, I am very sorry for what this family is doing against you. But remember that not the whole village is that is like that family. You know, we are proud of you and, uh, and we are very happy that you were able to, uh, to save this hilltop from the danger of confiscation because you are also protecting us. So it is very, very uh, nice when, and empowering when you hear those these kinds of words coming from uh, uh, people from the village, you know, because this is the mission. Actually, this is our goal to protect yeah. the land. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, and I know that uh, this the relationship that you've had with Nahalin and the villagers there has been an important one.
let me yeah. let me ask you uh, um those of us who've been coming to your place for coming to the farm for a number of years shock is probably not a strong enough word but the, the building of the yeshiva i mean just uh, uh i mean aesthetically but also just in terms of its impact on the farm on on the land itself uh on the whole culture of, of the, 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 the environment. Uh, you mentioned in your last newsletter, I mean, it was bad enough that it, that it was slated for that when we, you and I first met, but then to watch it slowly, slowly build and add it on and add it on and move down the hill. In your last newsletter, you talked about an addition to the yeshiva. Talk to us about uh, the yeshiva expansion the students who are there, are you having problems with them? Just what's the update on the yeshiva? Yes, thank you. Um, just uh, uh, some small thing before answering that question. Um, uh, you know, since March 2020, we do not have any international visitor on the farm and especially any international volunteer. I'm saying that because vol volunteer presence is very important for us because this is the kind of protection yeah. And we are always, uh, let us say, um, uh, you know, um, sometimes like we are uh, hoping that no attacks would happen because we are alone there, no international presence. So the yeshiva is, um, you know, they opened the school a couple of years ago, of course, as one building, but they kept adding it, uh, preparing the infrastructure, and now uh, more buildings are added to the school. So until now, it is um, a, it's like, like a primary school. You know, it's about like uh, children are going to school. We hear them on a daily basis. We do not have any uh, attacks from that side. Uh, the road uh, is uh, still, of course, blocked for us um, uh, from, uh, from the side uh, when, you come from, when you come from Route 60. Um, and hopefully, ho hopefully, uh, this school won't be visited by settlers or radical settlers who come with the ideology. This is the land that God gave to us. You know, this is, um, you know, with, with the presence of such settlers, we might have difficulties there. But so far, things are calm from that area. Well, that's good to know. Um, you have been concerned about um, access and of course, you know, there, there, for, for years now, there have been boulders on the road uh, about a quarter of a mile from, from uh, the farm on, the, on that road, that gravel road coming in from that end. Uh, is there any talk about closing the road up by the main road uh, um, because the yeshiva is there? Uh, could be. Yeah, we, we don't know yet. Still, the road, uh, until where the road is blocked, is still open. Of course, like we, we have uh, sometimes like there, there is a military presence or a security presence. And sometimes they, I can't stop the car longer there. So I try to go the longer way from when I cross from and to Bethlehem, I go the longer way through the sure. villages uh, to, to the farm. Uh, but they are now doing a big construction on Route 60. So they are trying, so they are trying to widen the road uh, on both sides. Uh, and to connect the settlements with Jerusalem. Now, um, of course, uh, of course, we don't know. We, we, we see the changes on daily basis, but we still do not know the bigger plan. We are not informed how it will look like. So uh, maybe, maybe this is uh, maybe the road will be closed permanently from that side. We don't know. We hope not. Um, so uh, of course we, we always we say we hope for the best, but we have to be prepared for the worst. Yeah. Well, I remember when they first started building the shiva, you and I talked about the possibility of its impact upon the the road there, uh, because uh, um, uh, that you know that's the access for like buses of people to come in. I, I remember uh, our, our friend uh, Terry Doherty and myself, when we were visiting with you, uh, we came with you in your truck the long way uh, from Bethlehem out to the farm uh, through Nahilin village. And you indicated at some point, even, even that route 
coming in from the bed. I remember coming under a trestle. Right. Uh, and you you mentioned about maybe roving checkpoints or, you know, that that would be a, a, an obvious place for Israel to maybe close off access and really choke the farm then from both ends. And so I guess I, I did want to ask you about road access and if you're getting yeah, how easy it is for you to get back and forth. And are you spending more nights now at the farm or how's that going in terms of access? Yeah, well, you know, like until now, we still have an, of course, an access, but uh, we don't know, we don't know what is going to happen because, you know, the plan when and if the the wall is completed uh, uh, west of Bethlehem, so like the area, the villages will be outside the city of Bethlehem, so they might put a gate for crossing, you know, with a checkpoint. They might do that, you know, we, we don't know. So we might have to cross a checkpoint. We might have to wait uh, for five minutes or five hours. It depends, you know, un but until now, we, we can easily uh, go back and forth with sometimes flying checkpoints between the villages. Yeah. So, uh, so the access on the long run, it might become very difficult. And that's why, you know, for us, it's also a, a way to think and be prepared. And that's why we, we try on the farm like to become as much as we can as soon as possible, uh, like self-sufficient uh, in order to, to, let us say, to continue to exist there even if the roads are blocked. You know? Now, of course, we have a daily presence on the farm and sometimes we are uh, spending nights on the farm, especially in the summertime. Well, especially without, uh, without uh, as you say, internationals who are there to kind of keep the farm protected, just their presence, right? Just their presence, uh, uh, you know, guards and protects the property. You know, just uh, the fact that settlers and government officials know that there's an international presence is such a helpful thing. There's a question from one of our uh, viewers here. Uh, it's it's a general question about just when internationals might be allowed back into Israel, but of course, that impacts when internationals would be allowed uh, to come and stay with you and work on the farm. Have any idea about when that might be? Yeah, I hope. I mean, uh, you know, like I have, for example, some volunteers who are uh, planning to come in the summer, in June and July. You know, so um, we don't know when they will open the borders. Uh, but I, I think, you know, uh, maybe uh, starting October, you know, things might come back, not to normal, but slowly, slowly back to normal. You know? So we hope, we still hope for this year to receive some volunteers and also to, see, to, to receive some international uh, groups as a presence on the farm. Now, uh, for us, you know, as, you, as I said before, um, you know, the international presence is very important, very important. Uh, it's a kind of protection, but also we need the international presence or the, the people because we want through our story to empower the people and this is missing. And that's why I'm, I'm grateful also for those kinds of meetings with Zoom, you know, even if it's not like uh, the real meetings, you know, as in person, but it's very important because our our you know our uh, message is should be reached out to other people. So we need our story to empower people, and this is at the moment missing through the more presence on the farm. Yeah, yeah. Well, your story you, you're you're exactly right. I mean, your story is uh, such an important one, not only uh, to to encourage and urge people to support you, but your witness of faith and your witness of hope does empower and uh, uh, empower the rest of us in our own faith journey and also in our own sense of resistance uh, in this country. So it's a model, but it's also an encouragement for the rest of us. Thank you. This is, this is um, very important. It's mutual. Yeah, yeah. So, and this is because we believe like 
uh, you know, like I receive a gift, but I also want to give a gift. And receiving and giving is, is important for, for us as people, you know. So I give, you receive, you give me, and I receive. And this is how it should be, the, the kind of uh, relationship. You know, one of the things, let me just talk more personally for a second, Doug. One of the things about you, I mean, there are many, there are many organizations and individuals in Palestine that we can support. And many of us on the call here do, you know, many organizations. But one of the things about you that is a, a beautiful thing is that really when, when we meet you, even for the first time, we, we feel like we've made a friend. And you, you I hope that I'm not embarrassing you. And, and I, I want to, uh, you know, I want to say this in a very real way to you. You know, your authenticity and your charisma uh, uh, touches each one of us and it moves us and inspires us. And we feel connected to you. You know, I mean, it's, it's a personal, real connection. And so I, I know I speak for many of us on the call here by just sharing that with you. So uh, I, I want to say thanks to you for that. And it is a mutual, it is a mutual relationship. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is actually how it should be. Yeah, because we, we belong to one another. You know? We need to stand with one another and support one another. Let me ask you, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the settlements before um, and the expansion of the settlements and the, the roads between the settlements that are kind of encircling, right, encircling the farm and the village. Uh, what's the timetable for that? Update us on the, on the settlements. Well, you know, like the, um, the, the settlements are, are expanding on Palestinian ground. Of course, like uh, last year, we were uh, there was a big talk about the about annexation, and then they postponed the plan, and then they are not talking about it in the news, but the facts are being created. You know, when when we see you know the bulldozers are working day until like uh, late evening, um, uh, you see the infrastructure is being prepared, and uh, and uh, we, we as I said before. We don't know the bigger plan, but we see the expansion on daily basis. You see the, the settlements are growing, buildings are added, uh, roads, uh, better infrastructure. And uh, yeah, for us, it's, uh, it's a frustration because, you know, we at first, we don't know what is going to happen. Like this, um, the situation is uncertain for us. But at the same time, you know, we are not allowed to have a tent on our land, you know, yeah. so even the basic infrastructure, uh, it's, Im it's impossible. So we need always a permit that we will never get. So we have many demolition orders, not only for structures, but also for tents and shades. And this is a kind of frustration we have to deal with on daily basis. You could make a tent out of the number of demolition orders you've received. That is Sean. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh my God. Yeah, man. Um, well, um, so are, are there any new structures on the property? I mean, is I, maybe I shouldn't ask you that uh, since we're going to put this on YouTube later, but I know that you've had some tents, a couple of cisterns, things like that. Right. And we have also renovated some uh, existing caves and we have the two old houses there. Right. Yeah. But uh, always if we, I mean, of course, many of our structures there, or like uh, temporary structures, we could say too, are uh, under a threat to be demolished. Of course, in order to, to try to stop those orders, we, we, we went the legal way, we appealed and we applied for permits in order to keep it in court uh, I, I, and to prevent the structures from being demolished. Um, yeah, but uh, there is no additions now to what so far is uh, existed on the farm is yeah, nothing new in the last couple of years or so yeah right. yeah well you haven't had the volunteers either there so yeah that makes sense uh anything else you want to say about the annexation plans more generally i mean i know the the circling of the settlements but uh, uh, uh israel's annexation plans that uh, uh were given kind of the green light 
by the previous American administration really sped things up, didn't it? Well, um, of course, like we are talking about, for example, like, um, you know, 60% of the West Bank, which is so-called Area C. And, uh, and of course, like, uh, if we are talking about a two-state solution, it will be impossible for the Palestinians to establish an independent state um, with all, I mean, or we're talking about the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem with all the existing settlements on the ground. And the settlements, by the way, are growing to become uh, small towns and cities. You know, yeah. like the biggest one in our area uh, has about uh, more than 60,000 people. And most of the settlers there they are living now for the second generation or, or maybe now third generation. You know? So it's becoming like part of their home. Now, yeah. So just to complete the questions, like with, with, with all the facts that are being created, it is becoming very difficult, you know, for, for us Palestinians in general, you know, in terms of the annexation plan. Um, talk to us a little bit about, uh, you mentioned about the farm wanting to become self-sustaining. You've been, you've been talking about that ever since I've known you, probably from the very beginning. Uh, which is such an important, important goal. So I've got just a number of little questions about just the, 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 the status of the farm. Um, uh, you said you're hoping to re receive internationals again by October. What's that planting season in, in the fall? And uh, um, tell us about the state of where you are, how how you feeling about being self-sustaining these days? Are you pretty close? Uh, how are you feeling about it? Um, well, you know, um, in October, we don't have a planting season, but we have the harvest. The last harvest will be, will be the olive harvest. And it would be great if uh, at least um, uh, to have international presence during the olive harvest. You know, we run uh, a couple of harvest camps uh, throughout the year, starting in May until October, but uh, you know the uh, the highlight is the olive harvest for us. So I hope by October, end of October, uh, some of the volunteers, international volunteers, could join us uh, during the olive harvest. Now, from the beginning, from the beginning, uh, we uh, of course uh, we try uh, we try to you know to to make the farm self-sustaining you know this is the goal this is the big goal and this is also the healthy way to grow to be also uh, independent and if possible also financial of course in a situation like ours when we have we we still have like the uh, legal uh, battle going on expenses for lawyers and now uh, the, uh, also from the palestinian side you know and the covid so we we try you know like um uh, the way we are trying to do it is that when we started to invite international presence, because it was important for us, the first, the first goal is to, to help the people understand the situation through listening to our story. So that's why we always say, come and see. We need you to come and see. We need you to come and connect the, the land, not with the stones, with the dead stones, that are all that are around. We don't want people just to come and take pictures of churches, uh, synagogues, mosques, whatever, and then go back home and say, okay, I was in the Holy Land. No, we need people to meet people. We need to listen to their story and bring them back with them home, you know? And this is exactly why we started inviting people to our farm. We need the people to listen to our story, understand, but also go back home and become peacemakers in their own communities. Yeah. Uh, on, the, on the other side, also the international presence uh, brought uh, some financial support to the farm, like, you know, with, uh, um, let us say, um, offering, you know, lunches and dinners, uh, also staying on the farm. This also helped financially to sustain the farm and to cover uh, some of its running costs, running expenses. Yeah. So um, now uh, your question was how close you are. Um, I can say like uh, until 2019, 
I don't want to say like, you know, we were, we are close, but we are on the track, you know, but with the, with 2020 and 21 with COVID-19 and with the lack of international presence and coming, you know, as groups, it is becoming more difficult and the increase of the legal expenses. Now you... on the same side, on the, on the, you know, like parallel to that, of course, we cannot sustain the farm without investing in, uh, you know, in water projects, yeah. in uh, uh, wastewater projects, in building new systems, in, uh, you know, like uh, in um, uh, the uh, energy, like solar system, you know, because we have no electricity there, we have no running water. And also uh, in terms of uh, production, to increase the production of the farm, to make agriculture as a main source of income, not only to support the family or you know to support the the, the project and uh, all related all related activities and programs, but also to empower other neighbors yeah. to show them because many of the Palestinians right now and especially young people uh, who are in the different villages they are working in building settlements. So the idea is like to help people understand, I need to go back to the land. I need to give the land in order for the land to give something back to me. And yeah. I cannot respect the land without mixing my, my hands with the soil. So we need to be connected with the ground, not only for our sake, but for the sake of the new generation. Were you able to do all the harvesting you needed to do without internationals in 2020? Well, uh, yes, I mean, it was difficult, of course, uh, you know, usually uh, we finish the harvest uh, within uh, 10 to 15 days, you know, with, with more uh, international uh, presence and volunteers, but uh, it was more difficult for us, you know, uh, during that time, it was longer. Um, yeah, but we managed to do it. Also, we, uh, we hired some uh, workers to help, local yeah. workers. I remember how excited you were a few years back when you started replanting Daher's Vineyard in sort of uh, in in uh, um, in honor of your grandfather, and you began making your own wine, taking taking you back to kind of the the farm's beginnings, you know, beginning a hundred years ago as Daher's Vineyard. Uh, how's the vineyard coming along? I know the settlers. I'm sorry. I know the villagers destroyed some of the some of the uh, uh, um, some of the vineyard. But how's the vineyard coming along, and how's the winemaking coming along? Well, uh, yeah, it was um, last year was hard. It was difficult to do. So we we uh, to make wine, but we made uh, grape syrup, and uh, you know, just like to just like for our use. Um, now the vineyard is, is very important because, um, you, know, uh, you, you know, like uh, it, it has to do also with our faith, you know, like when, when Jesus said, I am I'm the vine and you are the branches. You know? So very important, you know, the vine. Um, uh, uh, also like during the time of my grandfather and my father and uncle, um, you know, and especially in, in the year um, 2000, sorry, in the year 1936 um, with the Arab revolt and the new immigrants, you know, during the, the British mandate period, uh, people came to the farm and destroyed 25,000 grape trees from the farm. So, um, uh, so it, was, uh, it was a big loss for my father and uncle. And they started in, in 1936 from below zero. You know? And so I said, you know, as to honor, uh, to honor them, you know, and, uh, you know, they spent all their lives struggling to keep this farm and to continue to stay on the same track of their parents. Uh, with all the challenges and, and especially also living under occupation all their lives. We uh, wanted to honor them by returning this to life again. And that's why we planted, uh, you know, thousands of new grape trees that started to, started, you know, to bear fruits 
you know, and to bring the tradition of making wine and grape syrup again. Uh, I remember how excited you were to share that news uh, with me. I know you shared it with a lot of people, but when you first decided to replant those uh, the vineyard again, it was really uh, there was a there was a, a, an extra gleam in your eye to, to do that in honor of your grandfather. Yeah, yeah, it was it was important for us, you know, because it's like, you know, we feel here, um, yeah, you know, um, uh, it's it's a gift that we received. And a gift cannot keep, cannot, we cannot keep, we need to, you know, we need to, to do the best out of what we were given. Yeah. And at the same time, it is, a gift is a responsibility. So we got this land from my father and uncle, and we need to do the best out of it. Not only, not only for the land itself, but to make the land as an inspiration for people. You mentioned about October um, kind of opening back up again. Have you made a decision already about the, the children's summer camp? Is that not going to happen then? Or are you still kind of waiting to make that decision? Well, uh, yeah, maybe for this year, uh, of course, like uh, actually we, we have, um, uh, we, we, we still have uh, some plans and we are, uh, by the way, um, uh, working with, with a group from Iowa. Uh, they were planning to come and be uh, part of our summer camp. Uh, this, I mean, the plan was in 2020, uh, we started and then to come in 2021 to, to be with us during the summer camp. Is but that the book project, excuse me, Dad, is that the book project that you're working yeah, on? Exactly, right. Tell, yeah. tell us more about not just the camp, but tell the folks about the book project with the group in Iowa. Yeah, you know, um, you know, for us, maybe just to explain, we do every year a children's summer camp uh, on, on, uh, on the farm, working with about 50 children. Um, and of course, it's not like an alternative to other uh, uh, summer camps that were done and organized by uh, very good organizations. But our aim is to bring the children out of their areas, out of their walls, out of their homes and connect them with the land. You know, because the best, the, the important thing is to have the children from the beginning connected to the ground. You know? So that's why it's important for us. And at the same time, uh, try to, uh, teach, to teach them how the environment is important for us, you know? how the land is important, how nature is important. So um, always we have a theme for our summer camps, like uh, with with ha with heart and hand, we we change the land. So uh, on a speaking tour with Beth um, uh, two years ago or three years ago, uh, we met a group. You know, on uh, with the dinner, we we met a group of of people, and we were talking just about uh, the idea. I mean, uh, in general, to say we need maybe to document to do something related to those children because we ask the children. Uh, to write their stories or a poem, you know, we need we need their voices to be heard in other places. You know, so a working group was established, and we we started to be in touch uh, with one another through email, trying to uh, organize some stuff, trying to you know to put some uh, ideas together, um, and uh, and the plan is uh, for this group to come. Uh, I mean, for this working group. Or some volunteers to come from Iowa and uh, and do the summer camp with us, and be responsible in documenting the activities and the the children's stories in a small booklet. Um, uh, and uh, we try to we we called we call the summer camp um, the uh, from the ground and up. You know, we need to grow from the ground and up. You know, and I hope that this would be possible uh, for next year. This year, we might have a small summer camp, but uh, uh, not uh, the way we want because of the situation still uncertain. I have a couple of questions from our friends who are viewers who I, that I wanna to get to. Has the Palestinian government authorities been any help to the farm either with uh, 
the Israeli government with that issue or with the villagers? I mean, have you have you had any assistance from the uh, either the Bethlehem municipality or, or the the government in Ramallah? Well, you know, like uh, of course they cannot help uh, with the uh, Israeli uh, side because it's uh, different. And then the Israelis would say it's Area C, you know, it's under Israeli control. But of course, like um, uh, um, from the Palestinian side, we appealed to the court and also we appealed to the Palestinian government, uh, uh, you know, to and and explain the situation. Uh, uh, of course. Uh, it was not easy, but uh, at the end, we got a paper from the governor of Bethlehem, you know, to, to stop the, those uh, attacks from, this, uh, from those people, you know, the, uh, stop the attacks on the farm. So there are some, uh, you know, uh, uh, some, let us say, like some uh, small steps done, uh, although with restrictions, because, uh, you know, even the Palestinian police cannot operate in, uh, on area C without getting a permit from the authority, the Israeli authority. So it is restricted, but still, you know, we have some, uh, hopefully some steps uh, forward. You welcome the British ambassador. Did I read that in the newsletter as well? The, uh, the British ambassador in the last year or so has visited the farm? Yes, uh, we have, we tried to keep- countries have had dignitaries or politicians visit. Well, you know, like, uh, for us, it's like important to update uh, the the uh, you know like the people. Uh, he came and visited like a couple of year, a couple of weeks ago. Ah, that uh, yeah, that it's, uh, yeah, it was uh, recently, um, and um, uh, you know like um, always, um, if they receive any uh, you know any uh, groups or like uh, politicians coming to visit, they always try to bring them to the tent of nations. Because there also it's like a visual example. When we, when we talk, when you talk about the, the situation, uh, you see it on the ground. When you talk about the settlements, you can see roadblocks, uh, uh, settler roads, you know, all of that can be seen in our example. And at the same time, to show the, uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, our nonviolent way of resistance, you know, like it's, it's you know, how we are able to stay as a witness in this very difficult situation and acting nonviolently. So uh, yeah, he came to visit and we was, was, uh, was a good visit and we updated him. Uh, he will be leaving his office in, 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 a, in a month or two, but uh, promised that um, uh, you know, the new one will come and visit. And so this contact will continue. Um, uh, at the end of this month, I will have the, uh, the Swiss uh, ambassador to the, you know, the Swiss uh, is coming to visit the farm. So those kinds of visits are important for us. I mean, um, I'm not saying here, you know, through those visits, we will have all our problems uh, being solved. No, but for us, uh, it is a way uh, to keep this connection. With uh, with internationals and especially uh, also with um, I mean not embassies we call them here like representative offices sure. that are working for the Palestinian Authority you know like in in Ramallah you know I'm aware of the time here Daoud I have a couple more questions for you and then we'll wrap it up um, I want to ask you about elections uh, first I've spoken with some friends in Bethlehem you know and. Uh, they tell me that uh, they really didn't even pay attention all that much to the recent Israeli elections because, of course, uh, heiko oh heik, you know? <laughs> I mean, uh, six of one, half a dozen of the other, right? It, it didn't really matter who, who uh, would be forming the government. Uh, I'd be interested, though, in any, any uh, uh, um, thing you'd like to say about the Israeli elections. And then secondly, we keep hearing about... Uh, um, the Palestinian Authority may be calling for elections sometime soon, but it's always sometime soon, right? Always, always sometime soon. So any, any word about those elections or potential elections too? Well, you know, like for, for um, let us say, you know, generally speaking, you know, many people are, are fed up from politics here. 
you know, we, we are fed up from uh, listening to promises and, and, and always hope uh, tomorrow is going to be better, you know. So people are getting more, uh, more frustrated because of the situation. So uh, actually not that many people have any, any attention about the Israeli elections because, the, you know, you, you, you feel uh, the, same, the same faces are, you know, like uh, the same faces are coming back again with the same policies. And since we know the say the policies, so uh, what can we do? So this is the reality. So that's why uh, you don't see any changes on the ground. Yeah? Uh, with the Palestinian uh, elections, you know, they uh, they we hope we hope to have them on the twenty second of May. So there is a date for the Palestinian election, and this is done after. Um, 15 years, something like that, for the first time after 60, 15 years. So most of the young generation did not vote. It is something uh, good, you know, to have, uh, you know, uh, to participate in the decision making. Um, but of course, still, you know, the, the, there is a fraction between uh, the West Bank and Gaza. There is also um, uh, a problem of trust, womb to trust, who is going to change the reality. So we have some uh, issues with our own elections, but I hope uh, we will have them um, uh, next month. I hope so. We don't know their situation. And especially if, um, if the Israelis won't allow the Palestinians to have their elections in East Jerusalem, it might uh, stop, it might you know, uh, uh, postpone the elections if that happens. Saud, all, all of us who know you know that at the foundation of who you are as a human being, at your heart of hearts, uh, at, the, at the basis of your resistance is your deep and abiding faith in Christ, your, your faith. Uh, and so I just, I wanna acknowledge that and, and recently, the Christian community in Palestine issued uh, a cry for hope with hundreds of endorsements, right, by church leaders, theologians, and others in Palestine and all around the world. And I'm going to just read a couple of sentences and then ask you to just talk about your own personal faith and the cry for hope from the Palestinian Christian community, if, if you don't mind, okay? So the body of Christ can no longer stand by as world leaders and the international community trample on the rights of Palestinians to dignity, justice, and self-determination under international law. The integrity of the Christian faith itself is at stake. The Kairos document cry for hope is our cry for justice. Our struggle for justice and rights will never cease. It is our reason for being as Christians, the pursuit of and establishment of justice. Peace without justice is inconceivable. So, please. Well, you know, like, um, I mean, it is, a, it is very important um, that this message is coming out of Palestine and especially from the Palestinian Christians. Uh, one thing is that many people they in all over the world, they don't know that uh, Palestinians and Christians are existing here. And uh, many people, they think that we are converted into Christianity. Many people, they don't know that we are existing from the beginning, you know, uh, since, you know, the first ones who got the message are actually the, uh, the shepherds from Beit Sahur, you know, so, so we are close to, you know, we are, close to that message. Um, and, and that's why it's important for our voice, even we are a small minority. You know, we are maybe 1.2% now from the whole population, but still we can make a difference. You know, they, they, the Christian churches and organizations are very active in the society here, you know, even with small numbers. Um, but we need also our voices uh, to be heard outside uh, to talk about justice, you know, to talk about the uh, self self de determination, uh, the right to to live in peace and dignity and freedom, yeah? 
So all are important things, messages for the whole world. You know? And we're expecting our brothers and sisters around the world to stand with us and to walk with us step by step uh, on the long way to achieve justice. Yeah. So um, faith is important um, and, and being patient is also important. We cannot like achieve maybe, you know, like many people might say, well, we are trying to do something since years and the situation is getting worse. Of course, that doesn't mean that we have to stop doing things. You know, we need to continue. I can do whatever I can do in my limited situation. And I always believe what I'm not able to achieve, we need to invest in the new generation. We need to give the opportunity to the new generation to continue to take over and make it better. So that's why for us, it's, uh, it's a life journey. Yeah? And it must be based on, on faith. So You're without, Go ahead, please. Without, this, without this foundation of faith, it's very hard to continue the journey. Your own personal faith in Christ uh, as, a, as, as being from Bethlehem, uh, but that has grounded, right, your, uh, your, uh, your Daoud. You always introduce yourself as another Daoud, right, another David. Uh, but but your, your commitment to nonviolence and your commitment to the land, both of those come out of your Christian faith too, does, do they not? Yes, for sure. Uh, one thing is because, um, you know, like uh, David, the biblical David was a shepherd. And very important. So I am. I'm also. My name is David. So, so I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm. Tr I'm trying to do to do with 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 the land. You know, to do things with the land. Um, also, like for me, uh, for us, you know, Jesus was a farmer, too. You know, when we when we um, learn about the parables, you know, how he was explaining, um, you know, like uh, parables uh, about you know, like uh, planting about the fig tree about the, the olive tree, about the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the grapes, the seeds, how a farmer is planting seeds, you know, he, kn he knew what he was talking about. Yeah. Um, and that's why, you know, we, we try to practice that through the work that we are doing and connecting ourselves with the land. Yeah. So it is, for example, when, when, I, when I plant a tree, I won't say from the, or before planting a tree, I won't say, well, anyway, uh, you know, it will die because there is no water. So if I start to think that way, I won't keep my faith. So what I'm trying to do is that I do my part, you know? So if I'm not planting the seeds, the seed won't grow. So the first step is I need to do something, you know? So I am part uh, I am part of, uh, uh, let us say, uh, we, you know, me and God, we are partners. So I, I'm, you know, like, you know, I don't know if you, um, I mean, I have to do my part. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then God will do the other part. You know? So, um, it, you know, and that's why for us, it's important to keep, to keep this faith is as long as I do something, it will bear fruits. We are not saying, you know, it will change the world or it will change everything. No, but it, it might make a change in, in one person's life. Yeah. You know, that's, that's enough. I mean, we need more, but this is my step. This is what I can do. Yeah. And, uh, and we try to work with, uh, with people, you know, with children to invest this kind of hope in them. So the moment they see us practicing what we believe in, it will help them to, to keep going and to keep themselves on the same track. We're so delighted uh, to see you, Daoud. Uh, you and your family have been in our uh, prayers. We can't wait to get over there and be with you in person and be on the land. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna let you, Daoud, have the last word. Okay, so uh, get ready. But before I do, I want to turn to Beth Moore from Friends of Tenta Nations North America to share a quick word. Beth? Thank you, Michael. Um, 
I am going to um, share my screen and just put up a bit of information that uh, you, some of you have been asking for. Um, this uh, shows you the contact information for the Tent of Nations, uh, the website and, and uh, Dawood's uh, personal email. Um, so that's there. I'll leave that for a few minutes uh, while I talk a little bit about Friends of Tent of Nations. I think many of you know the story of how it was founded, that uh, three individuals, um, uh, very similar to uh, many of you, uh, went uh, and visited the Tent of Nations. Um, uh, with eyewitness, pa what is now Eyewitness Palestine, uh, used to be Interfaith Peace Builders Tour, and they returned. Uh, they heard the, the charge, come and see, go and tell, and they came back uh, to the United States, um, Bill Plitt, um, uh, Mark Braverman, and Bill Mims, uh, and they founded and began, um, asked the question, you know, how can we support um, uh, this uh, project, this work, this message, um, and they came back in 2007 and founded uh, the Friends of Tent of Nations uh, North America. And um, <clears throat> our, our work has evolved uh, over the years. Um, there's um, the contact information for Friends of Tent of Nations, the email and the website, and my personal contact information should you want to be in touch. Uh, but our work has been, um, um, focused very much on um, supporting the telling of the story through uh, our tours. Um, uh, Dowd has come to the U.S. Um, twice a year um, through uh, the fall of 2019 um, and, and shared the story. And we've connected with many of you. I see some familiar names and faces uh, on the call uh, that you have been our help <laughs> in making the tours happen. And we couldn't have, have uh, had them happen without you. Uh, finding the audiences, the people to speak with, to connect with. And so we are grateful uh, to you for, for sharing uh, in, uh, in our work. Um, and so that's, that's really been uh, one of the primary efforts uh, is uh, getting the story out, sharing, uh, sharing it, and um, asking people to come and visit, to volunteer, um, uh, to do what they can do in their own communities, to be, um, as Dawood says, a mosaic stone uh, for peace. And um, in addition to that, uh, as, which has been talked a little bit about, um, we do have the, our email list. And so if you wanted to be on our email list, and if you're not there, I'm suspecting many of you maybe heard this, heard about this from either Michael's uh, email list or ours. Um, if you wanted to be on our email list, why I'd encourage you to, uh, to email uh, at the Fotana uh, email list and ask to be placed there. So that in case of emergency, as Dowd spoke about in 2014, uh, with the tree destruction, we could be in touch with you to ask you to take an action, whether it would be to contact a congressperson or someone in the State Department or whatever the action might be uh, to <laughs> express your point of view of something that may have happened on the farm. Um, and we call that our emergency response plan. And if you have contacts I would, uh, uh, and people you would like to suggest, I would like to suggest actually that maybe you uh, email um, the Fotana uh, email, or if you know Bill Plitt's email, I think that's probably also on the website. Bill Plitt, the executive director of Fotana, really heads up our uh, emergency response action plan and the connections that we try to build with uh, people in uh, US, uh, US government that might allow us to, to, uh, <clears throat> to take action if, if it is needed. So those are, are two of the things that we particularly do. And I'm sure many of you have visited the Fatana website and know the newsletters that come out and other resources uh, that are available there. And um, Adoud has mentioned, he talked uh, a bit about the, the book uh, project, but uh, other groups have uh, come and seen and done, you know, uh, a variety of things uh, that uh, uh, have supported uh, the, uh, the work of Ten of, Ten of Nations. Um, so whether it's through volunteerism uh, or maybe the story many of you have heard about after the tree destruction where a number of people from um, uh, Jewish Israeli as well as Jewish America came, Americans came to uh, help replant the trees and one of the things coming out of that, the Center for Jewish Nonviolence. So there are a variety of ways that people have, have visited, heard the story, heard the message 
and gone back to, uh, to work in their, uh, their own communities. So we thank you. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for your support, for your work and for sharing in, in uh, this work. Uh, and we're grateful for that. And thank you again, Michael, for, for hosting this, this event. We're appreciative. Oh, if you, if you are interested in hosting something in a smaller setting in terms of the community that you have, uh, uh, a, uh, a Sunday school class, um, maybe you have a, a regional uh, working group on Palestinian human rights that you think you might like to have something virtual with, we will be continuing to do that kind of thing, probably through the end of the year at least, and, and hopefully can begin some of the in-person things in 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Beth, very, very much. Daoud, it's uh, just so good to see you. Thanks for coming today. Uh, any parting words for us? Well, thank you so much, Michael, for uh, this opportunity. And I want to thank you all for taking the time and be, uh, be with us. Of course, uh, I am happy to be with you because this also give me, gives me also the empowerment to continue. Sometimes it is um, with all the difficulties that we are facing here, it is easy. Um, it's easy to feel lonely and to think what is going on. You know, all the problems are happening and what are we doing? We, you know, we are sinking. And sometimes it's easy to fall in the victim mentality with this situation. But I always keep, try to keep our, um, you know, like our principles. We refuse to be victims we refuse to hate. We are acting differently based on our faith and we believe in justice. And um, with this message, we hope to encourage also you to continue your work for justice. I know that most of you are active in working for justice in your own communities. And although the way is difficult and, and uh, full of stones and challenges, but we need to look forward because the cross is not the end of the story. The suffering won't be the end of the story. We should go through this valley, but at the end, hopefully we will succeed. You know? So the journey continues always with faith, with love and hope. And thank you so much.